Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of the Scottish Property Podcast. My name is Stephen Clark, and I'm joined as always with my co-host, Nick Ponte. How are you doing, Nick? I'm good, Stephen. Yeah, uh, we had a good chat there today. We've got an interview with somebody that you've uh, been chatting to over the last sort of year or so, a guy, young guy called Clark Davidson, 20, yes. 24 years old. 24, yeah. So Clark's been on my mastermind group for just over a year, a year and a bit. Um, and he's a really, really nice guy, young guy, hungry, and, and I like him because he's, you know, for those that know Aberdeen market, the young guys are distracted by the oil and gas money, the flashy cars, the kind of the fancy clothes, the watches, the lifestyle, where Clark's worked in the oil and gas industry. He's kind of been influenced by his parents over the years, flipping houses and, and stuff, and, and he's, he's always had an interest in property. So he's totally bit the bullet and, uh, and done his first flip, and he's just sold it. Uh, just a few weeks ago when he posted the pictures in a Scottish Property Podcast group and he made 40 grand profit off his first flip, which great result for a first flip, especially in Aberdeen. Um, you know, it took a bit of guts as well to do it. And, you know, now he's on to his next um, buy to let property as well that he's, that he's bought a decent discount and he's adding, he's renovating right at the moment. So there's a nice story for, for listeners, I think, to to take somebody's point of view from starting out with the journey because we do interview quite a lot of people on the Scottish Property Podcast that, you know, have been in property for 10, 15, 20 years and they've got a lot of experience, but you often forget what it's like to start out and the lessons that you learn right at the beginning. And so I think uh, Clark's perspective, I think, just takes it right back to the start and simplifies it. And I think it's really, really good. And I think people will take huge value from it. Yeah, I think a couple of things that I took out of the chat was that um, he didn't hold back. He just went for it. And, you know, initially he was going to live in, in this um, property and then he obviously decided to sell it. But he was going to, he, he was all about learning as he went through the process. And he, he said that he learned a huge amount from actually project managing all the trades and, you know, the do's and the don'ts and the different order that you have to do all the works in and stuff like that. Yeah. So he said it was a huge, huge learning process, which will stand him in good stead for his next project. And to be able to make 40,000 off the back of your first project, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's something we didn't touch on in the interview much as well, but, um, you know, it's kind of, he kind of carried out the first time buyer strategy where obviously he's classing this property flip as his own place of residence. So he isn't paying any ADS, which is saving, you know, on the purchase price, 137 grand. You know, quite a bit from a from another investor, um, and obviously he's not paying the capital gains because it's classed as his home that he's selling on. So the, yeah. the profit will be a good clear profit on that, which is a good strategy for people, younger people wanting to get started in property. Definitely a good one for the younger folk. Uh, not so good for ourselves, mate, who are bagged down with families and kids now, so we can't do that anymore. Yeah. But um, yeah, if you're if you're listening to this and you're young and you're starting out, then that's definitely the way to go. Albeit, as we were chatting to Kessel Salimi, a mortgage broker last night on the on the Zoom call, it is getting harder for a first-time buyer mortgages now after the, the coronavirus lockdown and all the rest of it. Uh, mortgage lenders are so overwhelmed and they are reducing the loan-to-value rates. So previously, it used to be like loads of 95% loan-to-value mortgages on the market. And Kessel was saying that now, you know, you have to put probably about, you know, 15 to 10% deposit in. So it's not huge amounts. And like you say, it's still a much better option to go down uh, rather than going down the route of uh, of a kind of like uh, bridging finance, for example, which is what we have to do now if we're doing a flip, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, mate. So without further ado, let's just cut to the interview. Thanks very much for joining us, Clark. Um, can you tell us a lot about, about yourself and what got you interested in property? Yeah, my name's Clark Davidson. I'm from Aberdeen. Um, I think I've always been in, in, well interested in property or um, wanted to get into it. My parents have done up quite a lot of houses through my life and it was just something I always saw and I uh, always really wanted to do. I think it probably would be my dream job one day down the line, but just now I do work a full-time job. Um, so about last April, I decided to make the leap and I bought a house. Um, it was aimed to be a flip, but the idea was to buy it, do it up, live in it for a while, then sell it. Um, it took a lot longer than I wanted it to. So I ended up not really living in it that much and I just sold it. So as some of the people in the... So, I don't so was that a property that was kind of put as your own place of residence as well? Yeah, yeah, it was. Nice. But what had happened is I bought it in April and the plan was to do it up and move into it. And about a week after I got the keys, I got asked to go and work in Poland. So that absolutely knackered everything. And then I never ever got a chance to really live in it. I moved into it for maybe a month. Nice. Um, um, so 
when you first got started, what what strategy did you have in mind for property and, and what was your goals that you kind of set out? It was really flip was always the thing I was more interested in. I'm not really, even to this day, that interested in buy to let. I think tenants are probably a nightmare and I'd much rather just get the cash up front and move on to the next one. But I realise you can't really find them all the time and it's not as easy as that. Yeah. Not, you're not watching Nick's um, post on the Scottish Property Podcast page about his lovely tenants the other day. That will hopefully give you some sort of inspiration. <laughs> Listen, I, I think obviously, like, first of all, Clark, what age are you, mate, by the way? Just so people... 20, 24. 24, right. Okay, so yeah, I think that probably I had that impression when I was uh, starting out as well, when I was in my younger days. I was like, I can't be bored with the hassle of dealing with tenants and all that. It's just something I don't want to get involved in. Um, so you are right. It obviously takes a bit more, you know, there are more things that can go wrong out with your control. So I can totally yeah. understand. But I think obviously as you progress, you realise that, you know, once you start thinking to the future and obviously to secure yourself like further down the line when you start like having a family and all the rest of it. And I take it you don't have kids and stuff just now? No, no, no. Aye, so once you start thinking long-term and retirement goals and stuff like that, then you might sort of start thinking towards like building assets and buy yeah. to let Well, I say, I, say, I say I can't be bothered with tenants, but I'm actually in the middle of doing up a buy to let, so oh, I, right, have right. Changed, I have changed my opinion. Ah, right, we'll okay, well, good man, good man. I knew, I knew it would get you eventually, mate. Um, so yeah, so you were you were really more interested in flips, but I'm, I'm assuming that's because your kind of parents' um, influence on you as well. Growing up, I think they've got yeah. they've flipped a lot of properties in, rather than having a buy like portfolio. Yeah, yeah, they they just not as a profession. They both worked full time, but throughout my life, they've kind of bought houses, done them up, and sold them on, and made a bit of money on the way. So that was kind of where it come from, I think. So so was your kind of goal setting out just to kind of flip a couple of properties and eventually replace your income from flipping properties then? I don't really know. I just kind of wanted to get going. I didn't have a long-term plan with it. It was just, I know I can make money doing this house. I've always wanted to yeah. do it. Let's go for it and what see is what it happens you, after that. What is it you do for work, Clark? Um, I work in project controls for a, well, they're, they're called Wood. They're from Aberdeen. So it's an oil and gas services company. But I'm currently working on a defence project in Poland. So I work away six weeks at a time and I get home for two weeks, which obviously makes things very difficult. Super, mate. Can, so can you tell us about this this first venture in the property and it's your first flip. You've just completed it. You've just sold it. You've got the keys. Can you talk us through the process, how you how you found it? How was it sourced? Yeah. Um, so I was looking just on the SPC, right move at everything. I looked at about five different properties and that was one of them. So at the time, it had been up for sale since um, September 2018. It was up for £190,000. It's a two-bedroom house, semi-detached. Um, in a really nice area, walking distance from the city centre. And I went to look at it and I could see straight away that there was a load of stuff being done. It had asbestos garage falling down, the driveway was cracked, the whole inside was just ancient. So um, I, I went around it the first time and came away and kind of worked out what it would cost to do it. And at that time, I didn't really know how to do it properly. I just very roughly did it myself. Um, decided, no, it wasn't worth it. Well, it would probably only be worth 200, 215 at max. When it was done um so just that was it kind of put in the back burner forgot about it and then i got a phone call again from the estate agent saying it had been reduced to 165,000. so i went back for another viewing and then thought well maybe it could work Um, got some quotes from builders for some of the like the kind of necessary work that needed done and used that as um evidence towards putting my offer in so i went a bit cheeky with the offer and put 135 grand in Oh, we like uh, cheeky did. offers. How did that go <laughs> yeah. down then? Uh, it went down all right, actually. They, they said no, but it didn't <laughs> sound like they were far off. So I put 137 in and they took it. Oh, so nice. It was, uh, yeah, it was happy days. So, you, so, so you've done, you done well with the negotiating as well by utilising yeah. like any work that was required on the property to negotiate yeah, we had, the price even further. We had, um, we had the, there was asbestos garage, so that was going to cost, the quotes I think were three, four thousand pounds. Um, there was some cracks on the brickwork, there was um, woodworm, wet rot, it had a lot of stuff wrong with it, so all them quotes together added up to quite a lot of money, so we used that obviously so as our reason. for talk about it. Let's talk about the renovation in full detail, because I, w- I want to kind of show people as well that the success of this first project you've done wasn't just a quick lucky paint and put on the market, this was a proper renovation, wasn't it? Yeah, it was full work, so... 
Mm-hmm. That's, that's pretty. Um, that's pretty kind of ballsy going for a full like for your first project for your first uh, <laughs> you know renovation going to full whack. You know, a lot of people start off just where we kind of like a paint and new carpets, but <laughs> did that not scare you? No, but all? that was. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was because I was quite new to it. I just think that I couldn't find the right thing that just needed a lick of paint. To me, I needed to find something right. that was absolutely knackered and I was going to put it back together and that was pretty much it. I like so, it. Just so can you talk us through the renovation scope? Because obviously you did mention that it was asbestos and there was a few, there was a bit of structural issues yeah. and all stuff like that. Well, yeah, so there was, obviously there was a, the whole garden was needing done, the asbestos garage, which... I did get quotes, it was going to be 3,000. I actually ended up taking that down myself, which probably shouldn't do, but I did wear the PPE and everything, don't worry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just just a disclaimer, we don't recommend taking down asbestos. By the way, always get professional. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, well. But you saved yourself 3,000 pounds, so good on you. <laughs> good yeah. on you, mate, good on you. I think I had, sometimes I people, people like to find problems a lot of the time. You know, you see it on the face, some of the Facebook groups, you know, the minute you post a picture up of like, some polystyrene tiles on the ceiling. People are like that, asbestos, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> it's not always well, had, that we bad. We we'll had them through all the roofs as well, so don't you worry about that. <laughs> Aye. Um, so it had, it had that, it had the, obviously the full inside. It didn't, at the time, the kitchen was quite boxy and it, it only had one side door to the, the whole house. So you, you would come into this kind of tiny box kitchen and it was a bit depressing. So we decided to knock down a wall in there. We also opened up the, the external wall to create a double French doors out the back garden. Um, so that required building warrants, all that sort of stuff. And then from there on out, it was just everything ripped out, you know, plastering, full electrics, full plumbing, kitchen, bathroom, everything. Um, so the list goes on. It was like, it's a fair refurb to get yourself stuck in it for your first one. And I'm, assured, I'm yeah. assuming the learning curve was just huge on that first one. Yeah, that would be my main thing was the I you know a lot of people always look at trying to find the right deal and make sure that your numbers match up and they always look at purchase price and all this sort of things. And people, in my opinion, don't really pay enough attention to the actual cost of the project, which is probably the main thing. I mean, I, I thought I was gonna spend less and I did, and don't get me wrong, I still made money. But um What did you, you budget? More. What did you budget initially for the for the well, renovation works? Rather stupidly, only I think it was twenty five grand. Right. Um and it was way more than that. It was, I think, in the end, it was about thirty-five mark. Okay. So, um, it's not too, it's not too it bad. Size the project and the area you're in as no, well for trades. No, and, and I, I was, I was, I guess it, I'd never done it before. And I, my cost, I, when I look back at the cost I budgeted now, I'm like, you're, you're, you're stupid, really. I should have seen it. It was never going to be that. But I knew there was enough spare money, and I didn't really have to worry too much about it, and I could just get away with it. So, so what lessons did you learn through the renovation project? Give us some like tips and really um, good lessons you learned. The order everything goes in, mm. because I messed that up. Obviously, with the first one, it was I had the I had the joiner putting the new doors in before there was even walls plastered, and there was all sorts of stupid stuff going on. And obviously, you learn from that. And this mm. time, Osborne's going, it's going well. So that's the sort right. of things. Obviously, the cost of things. What I didn't know. I've seen my parents doing it over the years, but I never really had never had to pay it for anything that was getting done. So I didn't know the, the exact cost. And um, it's just just making sure you're managing people and getting things done at the right times. And were you that project managing thing. yourself? Were you kind of managing everything? Yeah. Yeah. So what had happened is obviously I got the keys. I think it was April 10th. I went and ripped everything out myself. I think my, a couple of my friends helped me out. And then obviously I got asked to go to Poland and that was about three weeks later. So I left, I had, luckily enough, I had friends who obviously do all different trades. So it was mainly them doing things and I would just leave them a list of things to do and make sure the materials were there. So how did you find that though? working with like, you know, mates, if you like, you know what I mean? Cause sometimes, you know, friends that are in the trades can be quite difficult because yeah, it's a difficult relationship sometimes. I think, I think um, I did learn off the back of that, that because of their friends, things get done a bit slower. Obviously they're doing it spare time or whenever then. I learnt from that, and this time in Osborne, I've got certain people doing things that will be a lot faster and make things go quicker. Yeah, so that is yeah, definitely sure. the main thing. So treat it like a business more than like any. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You think I think you, you think you're oh well, it's good. I'll use my friend. I'll get it cheaper, but they'll end up taking twice the amount of time. And you've obviously got payments coming out, mortgage payments, whatever each month. That it's going to cost you more in the long run. So. Although you might spend a bit more getting a random guy in, just go for it if he's going to do it in a week and your friend's going to do it in a month. 
Yeah, that was really interesting sense. what you said about uh, the, the order of stuff. So I, I think a lot of people get tripped up there, don't they? Like they go and get stuff done yeah. and then they're like, oh shit, we never did that. We need to go back now and like open up a wall because we never ran that like pipe up there or something. You know? Yeah, yeah, it's very important. And if, you, if you've never done it before, you don't really know these things and there's not exactly a, a clear step-by-step guide somewhere on a website that tells you exactly how to do it because I guess every project's different. But, I mean, obviously, there is a basic, I guess, step-by-step way to go about it. And I know it now, which makes a big difference. Yeah. It's not nice cleaning plaster off door frames or anything like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so can you give us the results of this first project then, Clark? So what can you get, talk us through the, the rough numbers? What was purchased for uh, the network cost, your holding costs for the time that you held it, and then, obviously, I've, your sale price? Yeah, I can give you just kind of high level. So I think purchase price is 137000 um, our costs, refurb plus other costs involved, you know, bills, anything, come I think about thirty five thousand, um, and then we had our selling cost, I think a couple of grand, so we sold it for two hundred fifteen thousand. I think that leaves a profit of, I think it was about thirty nine something, thirty nine thousand pound. Great result for the first flip. How long did it yeah. take you from start to finish to do the refurb and then get the sale money well, in the banks in? This is where it all kind of went all wrong with that one. It was supposed to take six months. Right. And I was going to... Well, I've got a girlfriend and we, we thought, well, we'll go and live in it for a little while and then we'll sell it. And because we didn't finish it on time, I mean, I was away working and kind of didn't do it as well as I should have the Aye. first time round. I ended up coming home in February because of everything that was going on. And uh, we got it finished and we moved into it. And we were planning on selling it about then. And obviously the whole coronavirus thing came. So uh, we were knackered and we were stuck. Couldn't do anything about it. So we got it. It was good in some ways. We got to live in the house for a while. So we stayed there until I think the day that everything opened up again. I got the surveyor in and then we put it up for sale. So it went up for sale on the the beginning of July and it sold in about eight days. Or it went under offer. Would, so yeah. did, you have, did you have a plan B for the kind of difficult Aberdeen market then? Um, if it didn't sell, because we know the Aberdeen market is quite tricky, it's kind of class a depressed market. Um, um, you could have buy to let it, I guess, mm. but plan B for me would have been just living it for right, that right. one for the time being. Um, yeah. So that was that was it with that one. Yeah, super. I mean, I don't think, think I would have liked. Result. I don't think it would have been a great buy to let. I mean, obviously, I know now you always look at two ways, two exits, and at the time, I don't. I didn't really look at that. For me, it was either I'll live in it or I'll sell it. It was one of the two. And uh, I don't think it would have made a great buy to let. It probably wouldn't have got as enough of a monthly income. So the money's dropped in your bank account. What's next? Where's the, the treats? Spent already. <laughs> On the next project? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good um, man. Tell so, us all about uh, off, it. Off the back of that, um, we decided between me and my parents that we would go ahead and start a limited company and we would maybe try and buy some some assets, as you call it. We'll maybe try to buy some flats and do some buy to let. So Stephen can also tell you, I've managed to find through off the market from a quite a big um, property owner in Aberdeen, several flats. Um, so there was, there was, there was four actually. There was, or there was three flats. So there was two on Osborne place. Um, there was a flat over on Buckert road and there was, an attic on Osborne Place that I'd plan and permission to change into a two-bedroom flat. So I managed to get in contact with this guy. I went with Stephen, we had a look at them. And that was, it was quite a long time coming, really. I think it was December we first went. Long process, yeah. Aye. Yeah, and um, at the time, Stephen wasn't interested in that project and I was, I quite liked it. So I, I went along, had a look, and then I started negotiating with the, with the owner went back and forth and in the end I think we managed to negotiate a 26% discount on the whole lot if you bought them in one go or I think maybe 27% mm-hmm. um, and initially when I'd, I was looking at obviously I was looking at any way that I could take them all myself but it was just too much money I didn't have enough of it to, to be able to do that so I looked at other ways to get maybe one of them and then the end result was Stephen took two of them I bought one of them and we left the attic that did, with the planning permission 
He's a greedy um, bastard, that Stephen Clark. Yes, yes, I'm picking up. I got the short straw. I had to go and double sheet the ceiling in the upper flat I've got because of the fire regulations for that. (laughs) Wait a minute, he took two and you only got one. Why is that fair? Well, if if you've seen Orca Road, you'll you'll understand why. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Orca Road's just a a little little flat. There's nothing too special about it. I did want them, and don't get me wrong, I looked at every way to keep them. It just it just didn't have enough money. It's just that, that was the, the bottom end of it, really. So I was happy I got one, and he's obviously got the other two, and the deal still worked. So it's a, it's a good um, way of kind of learning about kind of joint ventures and structuring different deals and working with different people as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was good. It was a good experience getting. Obviously, usually I've just went through the, the way of ASPC or whatever, and it's just solicitor offer rejected or approved so it was nice to be able to speak to the owner of the properties and and haggle back and forth obviously i mean it was it's quite a big um, company they've got so they kind of had to go he, back with offers i mean and have, think about and all it. credit to you mate is he the guy's got someone like you know probably just under 200 properties in their company like he's a, he's a big time investor so for you to go back and forward and negotiate with this guy and carrying yourself in that and that and that level it's like it was a good it was well credit to you yeah, it was a nice experience, and get me on this. We still, we still chat away as well. So I think if there's anything there that I could get, then they certainly would. He would offer it up in the future. Yeah, like some of these, some of these, um, some of what he's got doesn't really match what I'm looking for. A lot of these properties are in good condition, or they're. It's just not really what I'm wanting at this time. Yeah. So, um, so I, what's next on this project? Then, is this one you intend on, you know, holding? Um. Yeah. Hopefully. Obviously, then, we've got two options. It could be either a buy to let, or we're actually kind of going against what people say with buy to let and doing it all very cheap. We're we're kind of doing this high end with the aim that we can get a higher end rental. But if not, it'll make a it'll make a good flip and hopefully it'll sell because it's it's of a good standard. So yeah, it's a really good area um, as well. This, these flats, who, yeah. Who was your? It's just out of interest because obviously there's quite a lot of talk, like Stephen said about the Aberdeen market being quite difficult to flip properties so who was your end buyer on the first project like who who was at the bottom were they they first time buyers or uh i think no i don't think they were first time buyers but they were they were relatively young they were just like there was no shortage of something yeah there was no shortage of people coming to view it and i the whole time i had that house and was doing it i had everyone that i know saying you must be crazy and sells and to be honest i didn't really listen to it because and everything now we're doing are the most, the majority of it is old crap, mm-hmm. and anything that's nice still sells, in my opinion. So if you do something to a good standard, then it will sell. It's just obviously having the balls to do it. Exactly. And, enough. and obviously, like and this is hugely like inspirational for our listeners. Obviously, speaking to yourself at twenty four and all that. Uh, I'm, I know you've got a full time job, but you know to give other people the kind of like the inspiration to get started you know what what would you sort of say to them for people that are struggling because they're scared to make that jump you know like is there anything you can sort of say to them that that would give them that boost go for it really that's if they've got them you know, either you've got the money there to go for it and you're not you're sitting on it and not doing it because you're scared in that case i mean just Go for it, really. There's not, there's no other answer for it. Go and find something, get out there, look for it, and try get the right deal, and just go. I mean, I, I know other people that I speak to that are in the same boat, and they're sitting on the money when it could be doing something for them. So, I guess if you've got someone in the other scenario who doesn't have the money yet, I get, I get where they're coming from. It's obviously going to be more difficult, but there is ways around it, and there is other people with money or whatever, and they can do joint ventures or they can help out and get the experience. There's always a way. It's just try and get involved. So. See, when you're going out there and you're making viewing appointments, you're dealing with agents and all that, you know, as a younger person, did you find it difficult for people to take you seriously or were you finding that was, was okay? How did you find that process of dealing so, with agents and stuff? Fine enough. I don't really I don't really share too much of them when I go and view things. So I just kind of, I go and view it and the guy will maybe speak to me when I'm there, but I don't, I wouldn't phone them and tell them what I'm doing and what I'm, because... In my opinion, they might think I'm going to try and steal it, and that's going to hamper me in the long run. So I prefer to just phone them up, book the appointment, go yeah. and view it, and then take it from there. I don't try and find out whatever information I can when I'm there that's maybe motivation or whatever, but I don't really – I tend not to share too much with them. That's just my opinion. Yeah. I think that uh, down here it's, it is quite difficult because there's – 
so many people well i don't know at the moment there's a lot of people coming off the back of courses and transactions falling through and that because people are just they don't really have a clue what they're doing and stuff yeah you know? but um if you you know you you go in there and you do what you say you're going to do and uh i quite like the fact that you went in with that, that offer i mean that's brilliant so it was a, a valuation of 165 and you went in with well, one- well the value the value was actually 190 but they reduced it to one six five because they couldn't sell it. They reduced it to one six five, and then yeah. you went in with like one three five. That's brilliant negotiating, and you got it for one three seven in the end. That's, yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, that is uh, negotiation. Don't think I'll get another one as good as that. I, don't, I was going to say, but it just shows you—you you never know. <laughs> you know, I mean, people are worried uh, when they go in with low offers. I think sometimes because they're yeah. scared that you know they're going to be laughed out the out the park and all that. But it just shows you that it's it's worth the try, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, the yeah. same with the, this new Osborne project. I think that's the same. It's currently valued at, I think it's 125. We've got it for 91. And um, hopefully then value will be between 160 and 170. So kind of got another good one there. Either way, whatever I do with it. You're doing right to buy, right, mate. And like you say, you're making money when you buy it. If you can yeah. find the right property and negotiate the right discount and or find the right way to add the value, then the numbers, if the numbers stack up, then it's a deal there. Go for it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think you, you need to in Aberdeen as well. You can't be really going with anything that's too tight, uh, yeah. just in case whatever happens in the market. In case but, it goes further again, yeah. Yeah, but I'm, I'm kind of the opinion now. I don't think it can go any further. It's probably, mm. it's hit it no matter what happens. So we'll see. And I'm I'm obviously, we're fine enough. I think we've got plenty of meat left in the game that it's not going to cause any problems for us. And we'll see where this goes from here. Um, can you let the listeners know where they can reach out and find you on your social media, Tom? Yeah, so off the off the back of the first refurb, we, we created an Instagram page. I, my girlfriend created it for me. And uh, we made that a renovation page. So it was quite um, just full on the house. And then once we, we always knew we were going to get to where we are now with creating our own company. So when we did that, we created what's called um, Harlow Homes. So it's H-A-R-L-O-O, Homes. Um, and we've now created an Instagram page for that. So you can find us on there. We've got obviously our first project, we've got our new buy to let, and we are on the hunt for something else right now as well. We've got a couple of offers in at the moment, so hopefully there'll be more to share soon. So great we interview with Clark there. Hope you found that interesting and it gives you some inspiration to get going in your property journey. And uh, just want to say, as always, guys, thanks very much for the support. Uh, Facebook group's still growing and we've had another couple of reviews so we'd like to read out a wee review this week uh, this is ben wilkinson 10 he's put great content lads just wanted to say thanks lads for a great podcast and set up with the community on facebook a scottish property community has long been needed and you have nailed it advice has been great recommendations with strategy and tradesmen etc perfect keep up the good work well, thanks very much ben it's much appreciated thank you very much ben we really appreciate those reviews so if- if you do have a spare moment and you haven't left us a review, we'd really appreciate um, more reviews coming in. It helps us get the podcast out and reach more people. Also, guys, if you've got any more uh, ideas for us, if you want to learn about anything specific, then please just message us uh, or put it on the Facebook group and we'll happily interview some people about any specific subjects that you want covered. So thanks again for listening. See you again next week.